Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zen Zbib. I was an IC graduate like yourself. I mean, hopefully in the future, you guys will graduate. Uh, and I have a couple of things to tell you today. So surprisingly, today we'll have the chance to go to the UXC, which will give you the chance to see the detector. And we're lucky because we'll be the last group to go down. So that's really nice. And second, welcome to the new control room. This is a control room that we built. And this is the place where all of the shifters can come around and monitor the detector. So this just came online and you guys got the chance to also see it. So just a bit about myself. So I graduated from IC in 2019 and uh, I was supposed to go to CERN as well in 2019, but I didn't get the chance to. And luckily enough, I ended up working here. So if history repeats itself, maybe you guys or one of you will get the chance to come here. So it's you have hope as well. And I went to AUB as well, and that's where I got my internship at CERN. And I have with me my coworker, Carolina. She works at uh, CMS Safety. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is Carolina. I am originally from Slovakia. Uh, I study in Scotland, and I am doing a year internship here at CERN as well. Okay. So the way the visit will go is I'll go underground and I'll show you guys the different places that we have. We'll be visiting the USC, which is the underground service cavern. That's where we have most of our resources to do computing and analysis and filtering of the data. And also the UXC where the detector is at. And there's also the magnetic field is online. So you'll be able to see just how powerful it is. So something like this will actually stick to it. So there's a bunch of exciting things to Hopefully see. Hopefully not stick. Well, hopefully not stick. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully you guys will see some exciting things and feel free to ask questions at any time to myself, Carolina, or Zoltan, who's helping us with uh, everything else. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So I'll go down and Carolina will take it from here. Yeah, so how I already uh, explained, there will be two guys, myself, uh, staying here on the surface in the control room and then Zane will go underground so he's just going to get ready now uh, get his safety equipment and um, then they'll uh, go underground uh, they'll be taking the lift they will be going 100 meters below the surface and um, in the meantime I will explain to you a bit uh, about CMS CERN where we currently are and uh, what this basically is what are you guys going to see soon so here you can see a map of the area uh we're right here cms so um, cms is our detector stands for compact muon solenoid currently we are in france so cern is actually um kind of uh in two countries uh it's in between switzerland and france uh, over here, we have our main campus of uh, CERN, which is actually on the Swiss side. And that is also where we have our second general purpose detector called Atlas. And uh, just on the other side of this uh, large yellow circle, uh, we have CMS. And then just to explain this uh, yellow circle, it is uh, LHC. So that stands for Large Hydron Collider. And that is our largest uh, accelerator, particle accelerator that we have here at CERN. So we have actually several of them. Um, I should have a picture here. Yeah. So um, there's a whole accelerator complex uh, which allows uh, uh, particles to accelerate to almost the speed of light. And then once they reach this uh, certain speed, which is 99.9999% of the speed of light, they are uh, colliding at four points in the LHC tunnel. So CMS, ALICE, ATLAS, and LHCB. So that is all four uh, detectors uh, on the accelerator. So as I mentioned, CMS and ATLAS here, they are our general purpose detectors. And then ALICE and LHCB, they have, uh, they're designed uh, to detect certain particles or um, specialize in certain areas of uh, the research that's being done. But then just to explain, um, the particle, uh, when it starts being accelerated, it's just in a bottle of hydrogen. And then from there, it gets injected into the linear accelerator. So we have a one linear accelerator. And then it enters uh, into the booster, which is uh, over here. And uh, that is our first uh, circular accelerator. And from there, it goes into the PS, 
SPS and then from the SPS it goes into the LHC so you can see um, it goes through several phases and now we can also see on the the second screen Zane he is just entering uh, the <laughs> this uh, underground so before you go underground so right now he's still on the surface but before you go underground you go through these uh, special personal access doors where you first have to badge your dosimeter which uh, allows you to go underground if you've fulfilled multiple trainings and get uh, special access requirements to go underground. And then also, once you enter that cube, uh, you could just see uh, Noemi, who is uh, also part of our team today. Uh, she had to have her eye scan, so it's honestly very personalized. And now, uh, the camera just froze for a sec, but basically they are right now in the room where we have the lift. So there's two shafts here, um, one that enters the service cavern and one that enters the experimental cavern. And I think, yes, I do have a, a picture of that here. So here you can see the service cavern. Um, Zane already mentioned that before. So when you want to go on the ground, you first access the service cavern through this shaft here, uh, PM54. So it's basically a hole that goes 100 meters underground. Uh, we have a lift inside this shaft, and this is the way you access uh, underground. And then, so in the service cabin, there's multiple rooms that are there to basically support the detector. There's the um, gas room, ventilation rooms, uh, counting rooms with computers, um, many, many uh, rooms that are uh, all underground. And then parallel to that, we have the experimental cavern over here. And that is just one big room with uh, our large detector. And uh, there is also a second shaft, a slightly larger one, and that was used for the, all the equipment, the whole detector to be lowered down 100 meters to the ground. So just to also, this is quite a nice picture here as well to just show, um, here you have the surface again, and then um, you would have this shaft here going down to the experimental cavern, so 100 meters in the ground. And then the second one, where Zane is probably just right here somewhere, uh, traveling in the lift uh, to get into the service cavern. And then around here, you have the accelerator, the largest one we have here, the large hydrogen collider that goes through um, all four detectors that we have. Here's just a little um, picture of uh, each of the detectors. So like I said, they're all built differently. Um, they have all slightly different purpose. Uh, Atlas and CMS are basically looking for the same thing. So they have uh, uh, sub detectors which will be looking for the same types of particles but they're designed in different ways. So CMS is actually um, has a diameter of 15 meters so it also is 50 meters in height which you can imagine is like a a uh, five-story building, so it is quite large, and then it's about twenty-ish, okay. twenty-one meters in the, uh, length. Yeah. Ah, okay. Carolina, can I take it from here? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I forgot the wrench upstairs, so we had to go back up to get the wrench. But anyways, I just wanted to show you the area around us over here. This is what the elevator that we use so that we can go down a hundred meters. So this place is a bit special because we have an elevator that is very well protected. So usually whenever you have a fire or some issues, people say, take the stairs. But here at CMS, we say, we tell people to go on the elevator because imagine going up a hundred meters of stairs. I myself could not do that. So this is why we have a fireproof elevator and everywhere around it is well ventilated. So that in case there's a fire or an oxygen defi deficiency alarm, which occurs if there's a helium leak, so we'll talk more about why we use helium here. And it's mainly because we have superconducting magnets. And if you guys don't know what superconducting magnet, it's when you have a magnet where it's cooled down to close to zero Kelvin, and then particles will be able to go through it with zero resistance. And you can put in as much current and have as much energy, and you won't lose energy on the LHC. So a bit to explain as well on the LHC, we essentially, ionize hydrogen so that we can get protons. And then we bunch the protons together using magnets. And we have a bunch of uh, protons together. We don't collide one proton by one proton. We have like a collection of different protons together. 
and then we get these two different collections uh, collections we get them to go in opposite directions and then they collide right in the middle of the experiment so carolina already explained that we have four experiments on uh, the lhc we have cms which uh, is where we're at right now atlas alice and lhcb and each one of these de these detectors do their own thing essentially what the detector does is that it takes a picture of the collisions when the particles go all around the lhc they will come to the detector and collide and this detector will take an image of it and we'll be able to see the detector and explain a bit more of what it detects so my connection is going to cut off now because i'm in the elevator i'll see you guys downstairs you're here to turn off Okay, yeah, so as you mentioned uh, in the elevator, the connection will be lost for a few minutes, but uh, he'll connect back with us in a minute or two. So our elevator is actually quite fast, so it does not take long to go that far underground. But yeah, so he'll be back with us in a minute. But then, uh, as he was already explaining, our detect well, not just our, all four detectors are like a big camera. They are to capture all the particles that... Um, basically would fly out so um, you can imagine all these protons that are bunched together when they collided head on um, many of them uh, at these very high energies then um, crash into each other and then we have even more particles um, coming out of it and here we have a lovely picture so this what's what you would see after um, from a a uh, proton-proton collision. So there's many particles spraying out in all directions. And yeah. that is exactly what the detector does. It captures each and every single particle that would be coming out of this space, out of the, the beam pipe where these collisions happen at the heart of the detector. So like I mentioned, it's 50 okay. meters in height. And, uh, can I take it from here, Carolina? Yeah, sure. OK. Uh, so welcome 100 meters underground. So right now we're at minus two. This is the place where we can enter the underground service cavern. So I'm going to explain a bit about the construction of CMS. So I'm an engineer. And if any of you want to be engineers, it's a bit interesting to learn about how we were able to create this shaft and also bring down this detector. So this detector, the reason why it's called the compact muon solenoid is because one, it's very compact. It's 25 by 15 meters and 12,000 tons, and there is no space in between. Every single part of it has a meaning. So while we were digging the shaft so that we can put in, uh, so that we can bring down the detector, we discovered two things. The first thing was Roman ruins. So you can imagine in the middle of French countryside, there's an image over here where we found Roman ruins and some broken pottery and some coins. And so anyways, we excavated it. And another thing that we discovered as well was a huge body of water. How, imagine how would you think of digging through a body of water? So the way we did this is that we froze the water, we made ice, and then we stuck cement on all of the walls. So this way we were able to go down to the 100 meters. And then we had to bring each of the, the slices of the detectors. So CMS, I like to give it an analogy. It's both like an onion, because it has different layers to it. And each layer to it is a different sub-detector that's meant to detect a specific particle. So Carolina already mentioned a bit that when the particles collide, they're going to collide with very high energy. And because of Einstein's uh, equation, E equal mc squared, we end up creating new matter. And this is essentially what we're trying to detect here at CMS or anywhere else. So originally we discovered the Higgs boson. This was really big for us. We got a Nobel prize, but now we're trying to discover new particles. And so we do this by when the protons collide, it creates new matter. And then we're able to analyze uh, using some physics. I'm not exactly sure how it is, but they're able to know which particle it came out of essentially. So this is what we're doing. So as well, I said CMS is both like an onion, but I also like to say it's like bread because it was uh, brought down slice by slice. So we can see here in the images, this is one slice of the detector being brought down in the cavern. And so you can imagine the heaviest slice took 12 hours to bring down. And there was, uh, it was a huge operation, 2000 tons, and uh, it took 12 hours to bring down. And the interesting thing as well is that CMS stands for a place, not CMS, but CERN in general stands for a place of collaboration. 
So CMS, it's an experiment, but it's also a collaboration of 250 different universities, AUB being one of them. And uh, it's from 250 universities from 50 different countries. And so you can imagine you had people from all around the world making different parts of this detector, bringing it here to France in the middle of nowhere, and then constructing it and somehow it works. And now we have a half a billion dollar machine that is able to detect particles. And this was made back in the 90s and early 2000s when the internet wasn't really a big thing and people were still faxing stuff to each other. People were really dedicated to work on something and just to, you know, collide particles and then discover the secrets of the universe. And uh, we ended up winning a Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson. So this is also what CERN stands for. It's a place for collaboration, people working together and working on a goal uh, like this. So anyways, we're going to go now to the service cavern once this door opens. And so over here, it's a bit noisy. Well, thankfully for you guys, it's not that noisy, but for me it is. We have over here, so at CERN as well, we're number one in creativity. We call these blue racks. Why? Because they're blue. And the thing that you hold the computers in is called a rack. So blue racks. And another thing as well, the restaurant at CERN, we call it R1 because it's restaurant one. So number one creativity at CERN over here. So essentially, whenever we're uh, getting the particle, the bunches of protons and they're colliding, you need to imagine how many collisions we're going to have. We're colliding particles and they're moving at 99.9999% the speed of light. And so we end up having around 40 million proton-proton collisions. This is a huge amount of data. So you can imagine if one of these collisions, when we capture it in the detector, we need to save it as data. So if one of it is maybe one megabyte, we have a huge amount of data. It's impossible to store everything. We don't have the capacity for it. So instead, from the 40 million collisions, we only choose 1,000 to study. And there's a bunch of reasons why we filter it to this amount. But the main reason is, is that it's too much data and we can't handle it. And some things aren't interesting because most of the collisions end up creating things that we already know. And we have some people who are able to take the theoretical part of the physics and take it down into the hardware level so that they're able to analyze and filter out the data according to what they want to see. So now I think at CERN, they're trying to find the particle for dark matter. I don't know if we will, but this is what we do here at CERN. We're searching for a needle in a haystack. From 40 million, we only choose 1,000 to study, and maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get a Nobel Prize. But you know, if we look at it in this way, sure, it's a bit, uh, oh God. Well, I'm not sure where to move now because there's just so many things around me. So. Anyways, okay, I'll go this way. <laughs> um, ah, I'll meet you on the other side. Anyways, for a lot of people, okay. If we wanna work on a goal like discovering the secrets of the universe and knowing more about our world, it's a bit difficult, but you know, you need to look at what we were able to achieve here at CERN in the last 70 years and how our quest to discover the secrets of the universe ended up creating uh, something that benefits society. And one of it is the World Wide Web. It started here at CERN. Also the technology for X-rays, MRIs and cancer prototherapy came here from CERN. So as well, you're gonna wonder what is cancer prototherapy and how does it relate to CERN? So in cancer prototherapy, what they do is they collide protons and then hit a tumor. Uh, sorry, they accelerate protons and then hit a tumor. And what do we do here at CERN? We accelerate protons, but a much, much larger scale. So funnily enough, the technology was able to go to cancer research. So this is what we have. And also, uh, part of the important thing as well as being an engineer and being at CERN is safety. So right now you see me, I'm wearing these Oompa Loompa shoes. They're safety shoes. Uh, they're meant to protect me. I also have my helmet. And this is a mannequin over here that is wearing a self-rescue mask. So when I first came here to CERN, I had to do a bunch of courses for safety. And one of them was learning how to use the self-rescue mask. So this is used whenever we want to enter the tunnel because inside the tunnel, um, here, we can look at this image. So inside the tunnel, we have 27 kilometers of this. And there's a bunch of magnets and all of the magnets are super conducting. So we have helium that is cooling the magnets and making them super conducting so that the protons can go around with zero resistance and get closer and closer to the speed of light. 
And so at any point, there could be an issue where there could be an, a helium leak. And if there's a helium leak as well underground in the cavern, there's it's well ventilated and the air moves very fast. So if there's a helium leak, there's going to be helium everywhere and you definitely don't want to breathe any of that. So this is why we have the self-rescue mask. And essentially what it does, there's a chemical reaction inside of it that creates oxygen. It's similar to the airplanes where the masks, you have to wear them. Same exact reaction. And so another point as well is here at CERN, we have our own firefighters. So some people like to call them the superheroes of CERN, but essentially they are to some extent because you need to think about it. How can a cop from Geneva or from France be able to come 100 meters underground and evacuate someone. It's impossible. There's there's no way someone can figure out how to do that. So that's why we have our own team of dedicated you know, superheroes that essentially come and evacuate us in case there's any emergencies. It doesn't happen that often, but it's important, especially in a complex place. There, there's a high magnetic field, there's radiation, there's you know so many things going on at the same time. You need your own dedicated team to help you in case anything happens. So over here, uh, Carolina mentioned it a bit, but essentially this is the accelerator complex that we have at CERN. So right now we are we have the LHC, but before that we had the SPS, and before that we had the PS, and before that we had the booster. So again, creativity, just a bunch of uh, acronyms. I don't know what they all mean, but uh, there's some big complicated words. So we have SPS, super proto-synchrotron, proto-synchrotron, not sure what it's meant to mean, but it is what it is. <laughs> so anyways, essentially here you can see the data as well at each one of the accelerators. It keeps increasing in speed and in energy. Right now we're doing uh, collisions at 14 TeV. It, uh, it's, this poster is a bit outdated. So yeah. So our next stop now is going to be to the UXC. So I think we'll cut off a bit for now and then we'll have Carolina speak a bit and then we'll show you guys the inside. So to be able to access the experimental cavern, you again have to go through another set of these doors. Um, so now you'll be able to see maybe shortly uh, so you're accessing um, the experimental cavern. And I didn't see the key. Explain, yeah, what he was looking for. So now, um, like we mentioned, the magnet is on. You could have maybe also seen a sign there with a, a big flashing light saying the magnet is on. So uh, this area is now restricted, and for you able to to be able to access this, besides all the access requirements that you have and all the trainings, you need a special key to um, be able to access. So that's what um, happened there. So yeah, so the same process. Otherwise, you have scan your eyes, uh, and then once it um, checks that it's you. Uh, who's bashed the dosimeter and entered inside that cubicle, then you're good to go. And now the same thing for no Noemi basically happens. Uh, you can see a bit more in detail the exact steps of it. So yeah, they'll be going soon into the experimental cover. And just for me to show you um, this nice picture of um, the CMS detector. Basically, it's a uh, all closed up so when Zayn will go inside you will just see this massive massive piece of uh, equipment but actually it's all uh, built from many small chambers smaller sub detectors and uh, like the name already says it's a very compact um, detector so it stands for compact muon solenoid CMS um, there are several sub detectors there's um, it has layers to it. So the first here you can see the beam pipe running through, which is also much, much smaller um, inside to the whole detector itself. I'd say that was the most mind blowing thing uh, when I saw it for the first time, um, that when I saw the actual beam pipe size and then the detector, it was really um, something that you wouldn't expect to see. And then, yeah, so the first layer here, we have the, the tracker and that detects any type of particle that will be going through it. So it just detects the the energy. Um, so it will say it will show you where exactly that particle went through, and what energy it uh, had. And then um, the next layer here, we will have the electromagnetic calorimeter and uh, that's one of the ones. And then the second layer is a hadron calorimeter. 
and both of these calorimeters basically um, interact with uh, certain particles like the electromagnetic one will interact with electrons and photons and then the uh, hadron calorimeter will interact with hadrons and it basically fully stops the particle um, going through and uh, that will be the second point of um, any type of interaction and then we're basically able to go back and see what what trajectory this particle took and um, also beyond the the two calorimeters we will have the superconducting solenoid that is our magnet which is actually the strongest wow. of its kind and that influence oh right so now you can see zane in the okay. experimental cavern and the detector yeah. there behind him in the red okay so i'll uh, take it from here so welcome to the uxc this is the experimental cavern or that we have here and this is the cms detector so you guys can see this <laughs> wrench is just floating in the air. It's going towards the magnetic field. So like Carolina mentioned that we have the most powerful solenoid magnet in the world. That's also why CMS is called compact muon solenoid. A solenoid because we have the most powerful solenoid in the, mag in the world. Compact because it's very compact as you can see. And also um, muon because we detect muons. So on the outermost part, outermost layer we have these things called muon chambers and these detect muons and uh, yeah so a bit to explain over here so just a bit of an interesting fact though this uh, wrench moves a lot uh, you can see over here there's the flag of Pakistan so the steel from there came from Pakistan again collaboration here at CERN it's the European organization for nuclear research but at the end of the day there's people from all around the world the collaborations consist of people from of universities from different places around the world so i wanted to explain to you as well so right now we're tomorrow we're going to start our run and we're going to start having collisions so during christmas time we have something called the year end technical stop and the reason why we have a technical stop is because you need to imagine if we're running this for a couple of months you have a very strong magnetic field so the machine is always uh, under stress and there's also radiation so we need to stop the machine for a bit and also be able to access different parts of the machine so that we can fix some of the electronics or problems that are occurring. So how do we do this? Essentially, each of these slices were brought all the way from up and brought down and then connected to each other. And in order to move each of the slices, we have these orange pads over there. They're called air pads. And so what we do is we put some pressurized air so that the disks can weigh less and then we're able to move them. So this yeah. is how I'm we're afraid, able to access. Sorry yep. for interrupting. I, I just want to make a, a, a comment on that. If the camera goes out of focus, this is uh, a, an effect of the magnetic field on that. So that's uh, that's just for the audience. Sorry, oh. you can continue. <laughs> OK. So anyways, the air pads put some pressurized air so that the disks can weigh less. And then we're able to move them. And so this is how we access each of the different parts of the slices so I can fix any of the electronics happening over there. And yeah, again, this uh, keeps on moving way too much. <laughs> it's just floating. OK. Oh, we can go up. So up from this way. OK. So what's nice as well, if you guys came here in person, you only have access to this part. But since you're doing it virtually, you have access to, oh, how do I open this? Okay. <laughs> so because you're doing the visit virtually, you have access to essentially all the different parts of the experimental cavern. You'll be able to see on top of it, below it, and it's great. So only people who work at CERN are able to see it, but now you guys are also able to see it. Well, technically, because you guys didn't uh, come here in person, but hopefully next year or no, hopefully one of you guys will go to AUB and be able to get the same internship that uh, I got and have the chance to come here. So, so right now, this is the detector and also the big solenoid magnet that we have inside the detector is also cooled so that it can become superconducting. And we have like a 5,000 lit, 2,000 liter tank that has 5,000 liter helium tank that has that's able to cool the magnet. And so, as well, another thing I wanted to explain about CERN is that there's always a vision over here. 
So essentially, this was thought of in the 90s and then built in 2000. And then also it started its first run in uh, 2010 around. But essentially, there's still plans to continuously upgrade the detector and upgrade the LHC as well. So right now we're in our run three, but then we're going to have another long stop and start another run. In our next run, some parts of this detector are going to go out and we're going to install new parts. And these new parts as well are going to be able to detect different particles, detect more particles. It depends exactly on what it needs to do. So even then, when this was made in the 90s, people had a vision to upgrade this in the future because you can't just keep the same machine and not upgrade it because then you won't discover any new physics. So we have to always think of a vision for the future. And so right now we have the LHC, but in the future, we're thinking of building the FCC, which is a future circular collider that's going to be 90 kilometers and be able to collide particles at a much greater energy. And just as a question about why do we keep going bigger and bigger and bigger? Because you saw in the accelerator complex, we had the smaller accelerator, then a bigger one, then a bigger one. And the reason why we keep going bigger, it's very simple. If you have a string in your hand and you make the string very short, and you spin it, it's not going to have that much energy. Well, this isn't going to spin, spin that well. But the longer the string and the more the circumference, the more energy you're, you'll have. So if this is, if there was no magnetic field and I was spinning this, the longer the circumference, the more energy it's going to have and the more it's going to hurt someone, essentially. So this is why we keep going bigger as well. There's always some sort of relation to physics one way or another. Okay. Oh, okay. Which way? Yeah. So also just to point out, um, in the experimental cavern, you can see there's multiple uh, levels floors that you can uh, be on. So that's just to have uh, different access points uh, onto the detector. There's also different um, can we go on machines top? that are used if you want to access parts of the detector kind of more inside like in the heart of it there's a scissor lift also a cherry picker and that's all just um can be operated uh manually to access whichever um area you want to access the detector and also how dane already mentioned um just not long ago we were in our year and technical stop so for a few months there was no experiment running there was no protons accelerated in the lhc no protons uh, collided in any of the detectors and then we had um, some of the slices so uh, actually the cms is built out of 15 slices they were all assembled on the surface and then each slice was individually lowered down through the large shafts into the experimental cavern and then reassembled in the oh. inside underground oh. so all these 15 slices they can be brought together and that's when we have the detector ready for uh, the experimental phase but then if there's any repairs to be done maintenance or even uh, new equipment installed uh, you can access the inside of the detector by basically just moving oh. these slices within the oh. um, cavern but yeah and then you can also perfectly see just how large the detector is next to Dane so you can quite see that is very very tall yep it's uh it's quite tall I mean I'm not that tall but uh <laughs> for a person it's uh enormous in front of you and you can see as well that the wrench keeps on going towards the magnet in the center I don't want it to touch the steel and make a problem so <laughs> I can. Okay, so we, okay, so it's quite tough, and I really need to put my my muscles into it to get it out. But it's quite strong. And what's funny as well, well, not funny, but um, whenever we turn off the magnet, there'll still be a remnant magnetic field as well over here. So if you guys did a virtual visit a month ago, I would put paper clips, and the magnet would be off, and it would still stick to it, but not this because the remnant magnetic field isn't that powerful. But right now, since the magnetic field is on, you can really see just how fast it goes towards the, the detector. I need to pull with a bit of force. Uh, so yeah, as well, if we walk around, we can see just how compact this entire place is. There is no space whatsoever over here to put anything new. And each one of these slices, you can see just how, how big they are. We need to move them so that we can access each part. So some of this will move like an entire meter. 
And then we'll have people with cherry pickers or with scissor lifts going up and down, working on all of the electronics all around us. So as I mentioned before, each one of these slices were brought down bit by bit. So a bit of an interesting fact, actually, the crane that we used to bring down each of the slices was the same crane used to build the South Africa World Cup Stadium. So it's funny how even some things that uh, were used here were also used in the South Africa World Cup. I mean, science and engineering is used all around the world and people need the technology. And here at CERN, we give technology for society for no benefit uh, because simply this is what this place is meant to be. It's meant to be a place for science and peace and for people to collaborate and work on a goal like discovering the secrets of the universe. I would also okay. just like to point out that if there's any questions, then uh, you can ask throughout the whole uh, virtual visit. So don't be afraid to just um, yes. put on the uh, microphone and ask me or Zane or we also have uh, Zoltan here, uh, who is part of the technical team and uh, he knows it all. I've never seen him not be able to answer questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know okay. if that was a question or just um, someone speaking because we can hear it quite clearly. No, no, we don't have a question yet. We will have yet. yet. Okay. Good. Okay. So one more thing as well to mention is I mentioned a bit about how safety is the number one priority here at CERN. And so what if something goes wrong here? What if, uh, I don't know, there's a fire and we need to turn it off? How do we do this? And some people thought about it already because this is a very important problem. If you have a machine that's going on fire 100 meters underground that has radiation as well, and I don't know what else. So we have all the way at the top these red funnels. And so these were installed and tested way before we put anything over here to make sure that our like last um, measure, like if anything goes wrong completely and CMS needs to have foam on top of it and turn off the fire, we have to test this out before we put anything. And we need to do this because this is as well as being an engineer, safety is extremely important. I mean, people think it's not that uh, important in some cases, but with a place like this, work with governments, you know, people are putting money into this. You need to work on safety and make sure that people are going to be okay if anything happens. So as well, I have this thing on me called a dosimeter and this measures how much radiation exposure I have. And this is also important for people to be able to know in case anything goes wrong, this is the amount of radiation he was exposed to. But anyways, the amount of radiation we get exposed to here at CERN is less than a pilot. So it's very safe over here in, in all cases. So we can also go a bit around. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the culture as well at CERN. So here at CERN, we have 12,000 people and the average age is roughly 27. That's a bit of a young age. So you have 50% of the people that are young like myself, I'm 22. And it's, it's fun, it's great. You know, it's a place where people can come here to learn, to experience something new and to be in a multicultural environment and to, you know, it's not easy to be in a place where there's everyone from all around the world and learning how to communicate with people. So as well, there's a lot of effort being put in communicating uh, the right information to everyone and making it clear. So as well about the culture, so 15 years ago, so under this, these are trench covers. So there's a place under here as well. You can go under the detector. 15 years ago, someone drew a painting underground. I can show you show you it on my phone and <laughs> it's still there. No one knows who did it. Well, this is as well. Like sometimes at CERN, you have random things like a caveman painting under a half a billion dollar machine. So I can show you uh, the image of my, on my phone. You know, it's a bit of a, a little fact. Yeah, you can see it, just a horse with a bunch of hand paintings. But again, this is the culture here at CERN. People will just sometimes do random things and uh, people also do great things like this machine. Oh. Okay. So it's a bit funny, but uh, thought I'd mention it to you guys as well. <laughs> uh, I would also just like to show a picture that was uh, showed before. This is uh, from 
the point of view is from actually the shaft. So it's a couple of meters um, above the detector inside the large shaft that goes into the experiment. We go cavern. anywhere else? And this was basically a few months ago when I How much already we mentioned have? we were in the um, uh, technical stop. And uh, here you can really nicely see the slices. So how it really looks like when it's open. So um, this is one size which is moved and then there's, I think, two more over here. And then really the heart of the detector is here, beam pipe, and then also this right here, that circle, that's the um, magnet. And then all of this around it uh, are muon chambers. We have actually four different types of muon chambers here at CMS. They all use different uh, technologies and ways to detect uh, muons, but they all detect the same type of particle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just wanted okay. to point that one out, but now we can go back to Zane. Can you unmute? Uh, unmute. Okay, so one more thing I wanted to mention as well about the discovery of the Higgs boson. So you're wondering why do we have four experiments on the LHC? So we have CMS and ATLAS. These are called general purpose detectors. And so essentially what they do is they are meant to detect anything. They're both meant to detect the same thing, but they're constructed in completely different ways. So CMS looks like this and ATLAS looks like a completely different experiment and it's much larger as well. So why do we need these two different experiments? So you need to think about it. When we're working at CERN, uh, CMS and Atlas, we work in the same building, but we're not allowed to communicate or talk to each other because we need to keep our research independent and make sure that whatever we discover is not affected by the other experiment. So when we discovered the Higgs boson, it was after a while and only the DG and a couple people knew that both experiments discovered the Higgs boson but they didn't want to mention it. Uh, they weren't the two experiments and the people who are working there can't mention it to each other to keep things independent. So when you have two experiments, find the same thing and they're constructed in different ways, then you can actually prove that you found the Higgs boson. And that's why we have CMS and Atlas, which are general purpose detectors. They're essentially finding the same thing, but in different ways. And so we have Alice and LHCB as well. They do different experiments. I think one of them is trying to replicate events uh, similar for when the Big Bang happened. And some of them also do some heavy ion collisions with lead. And at CERN, at CMS, we do some heavy ion collisions. Not sure for what, but there's a bunch of experiments going on at CERN. It's not just about the LHC. We also have some other experiments like Isolde, which are meant to find different isotopes for uh, medical research, for example. There's also other experiments as well all around at CERN that do different things. And there's a bit of an interesting experiment as well. We used to send neutrinos from the LHC all the way to Italy. That's crazy. You know, we used to send it like ha halfway to like from one country to another. And the reason why we're doing this is because neutrinos are very difficult to detect. And right now we have an experiment in the US with Fermilab. That's another uh, big physics la lab over there. And they're working more on neutrino physics. And so there's Sorry, an interesting story. Yep. Sorry to pause you there. Apparently, we have a question, I think. Yes, oh. we have a question for Zen. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, the question is on the, we're talking about how the two labs can communicate with each other. Is it also true that you're not allowed to see the results of your own experiment? It's in like everything is taped up and there's like sticky notes and labels over everything so that you can't see the results of your own experiment so that you don't bias it in a certain way? Because I want to know if it's a rumor or not. Well, the, the two experiments are not allowed to speak e to each other for this bias. But I mean, if you work in the experiment, you're allowed to see your own results. So of course, I mean, you're, for example, when we're doing uh, in our runtime in the control room, people are manning this control room 24 hours a day. You know, so you, imagine on Sunday at 4 a.m. in the morning, you have to come to, you know, look at physics. This is what people are doing here. They're working in the control room all day. They're monitoring the detector at all times because Again, you know, this is a sophisticated machine. You can't just, you know, go to sleep and not look at it. You need to look at it at all times. And we have the control room and now we just upgraded it. And people are manning this all the time. And people from all the different universities uh, in the CMS collaboration come out of goodwill so that they can man the control room and have people there at all times. There's always stuff monitoring. 
And even all of our data that uh, we get out of CERN is given uh, to the world as well. So even the, the physics uh, data that we have, it gets, it's free for anyone to use. So one thing I forgot to mention as well. So the data that we have here, I told you we went from 40 million to a thousand. And then these thousand uh, collisions end up going to the CERN data center. And from the CERN data center, they get distributed all around the world. Because at CERN, we don't have a powerful enough computing center to analyze all of the data. There's not, it's, it's a huge amount of data. You're getting a thousand collisions every single second for around 24 hours a day. It's insane. So that's why we have different computing centers all around the world. And we call this the worldwide LHC computing grid. And the interesting thing is as well is that Lebanon joined the worldwide LHC computing grid for CMS. So part of my project when I came here, I worked on uh, HPC4L, which is high performance computing for Lebanon. And I got to work on uh, the project for um, being the liaison essentially between uh, CERN and Lebanon for the project. And we actually had an inauguration in the Sarai in Lebanon where the prime minister joined and a bunch of other people in the government, you know, in, in Lebanon, and they, they inaugurated the facility. So as well, you know, CERN is somewhat, uh, Lebanon is somewhat connected to CERN as well with the HPC4L. So this is as well what CERN does, you know, we, all of the computing resources for HPC4L came from CERN out of goodwill. And they, they, they gave it to us. And now we have a supercomputer here uh, in Lebanon that is the, 60%, no, 80% dedicated for Lebanese researchers to work on uh, any peaceful research for, you know, agriculture, AI, tech, whatever, and 20% dedicated to analyzing data from CMS as well. So at the end of the day, when you, CERN is not a place where you give, it gives, you give and it gives back by teaching students like myself and also bringing a supercomputer that was never there before, that we never had in Lebanon before that exists today. And it's a project that's, you know, it's going through a bit of tough times because Lebanon is going through tough times, but uh, it's a beacon of hope in the end of the day. And that's, uh, you know, what we need to look forward to in the end of the day. So anyways, the worldwide LHC computing grid, it's, uh, it's meant to analyze, distribute, and spread the data all around so that the different computing centers can analyze the data and you have multiple PhDs coming into CERN as well, working on discovering different things in the data. And all the data as well that we have from way back in the day is still there. We store it on tape because you never know. Maybe when we go back to the data and analyze it again, we can discover something new. So, yeah. Hope that answered your question. A bit long, but uh, yeah, somehow got to the point. <laughs> okay. So I'm guessing right now, uh, Zayn is making his way through the experimental cavern back uh, to the surface. So again, he will have to take that same path through the service cavern to um, come back uh, to the lift and then to the surface. So in the meantime, um, if you've got any more questions. Um... I have Sorry? I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, how would you power all of this so it won't be directly connected to the I suppose. No. Heavy door. How how would you generate the electricity needed for all of this uh, super magnet? Uh, the where we get the power from. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's from the uh from France, the general power supply that you have for yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we purchase so... our electricity from the, the French uh, uh yeah, yeah. national <clears throat> grid. Uh, what we consume is uh, actually surprisingly low amount. We eat something like uh, 170 to 190 megawatts, 
which is uh, something comparable to that of a 200,000 inhabitant city. So not tragically large amount, I would yeah. say. Yeah, <laughs> so um, we really do try to recycle a lot of the energy here. Um, it is obviously still a lot we can see, but um, like uh, Zoltan already mentioned, uh, it's comparable to a city of 200,000 inhabitants. So uh, it is actually not that much power when you compare it to other large cities in the world. Yep. yep. Any other questions? Any other questions? You can ask about anything for physics. We have a Zoltan here to answer anything related to engineering. Your Zane could try to answer, or even just about. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to ask, what are the and are there any negative impacts on the environment from all of this process? And if so, how does CERN plan to make it more sustainable and more like environment friendly? So one thing about CERN is that you have so many different departments and teams working in different areas, things that you probably would not even uh, think of that there are, like uh, on the daily I meet people that work in teams that I never even knew existed here at CERN, you really do have people and specialists. Uh, can you unmute? On different types of the. <laughs> on different types of things and uh, so for that we also have um, a HSE unit which is for, for um, health safety and environmental protection and these are all this is a unit which is to support CERN all different experiments and uh, departments that we have here and uh, a large part of uh, this unit uh, many people are working on ev environmental protection and uh, all sorts of uh, other impacts it has yep. on uh, the life outside of CERN on the because as you could have seen um, the LHC runs through both France and Switzerland it goes underneath uh, several different towns or villages and obviously we don't want this to impact any way negatively on uh, the people living in the area so there is a, a dedicated team for exactly this. Yes. Yeah, so despite we are, oh, sorry for, no, for adding, for uh, <laughs> despite we are an international organization and we could use our own rules for for many of the things, we decided to, to make a more uh, strict uh, regulations uh, that, we, that, that we put together from the whole state regulations, that is the European Union and Switzerland's. Uh, environmental regulations, not only on the environmental protection, but as well as uh, radiation protection. Yeah. So we are even more strict than the, the host states. And apart from our own uh, uh, authority that we are looking, that, that is looking for the, the CERN's operation, the host states are keeping their eyes on us as well. So uh, I'm, I'm more in, uh, in the, the radiation protection. Uh, therefore, I know that uh, that uh, in this field, not only CERN agency unit is involved, but also the the Swiss authorities, and also I've already seen French detectors on site. <laughs> so, so we could could not escape. Yeah, and there's so it's very highly regulated because CERN definitely is in the spot spotlight, especially here um, between the member states, and uh, there there's people kind of even outside of CERN that are looking uh, out for these types of things. So um, I wouldn't say there's uh, any type of negative uh, impact on the environment as, is, as it is um, carefully monitored. Yes, it is actually, actually we always, that's one of our uh, key points that we do not want to have any negative impact on yeah. the environment. So 100%. it's not just the regulations, but also the uh, this is one of our uh, main concerns. Yeah, that was a really nice question. Thank you. Um, yes. I'm sure we have a lot of questions, but we're still a bit shy. So, but a question that we were lucky in 2015 or 16 to have one of your scientists to join, to come to visit our school and he gave a lecture to the to the students, and I remember some students asked, like, 
we're talking about billions and billions of dollars of projects. Who funds these? How does CERN have this much money and resources to actually do all of these? So as far as I know, it's uh, all funded by the member state. I can explain it. Yeah. Hello. Just check Hello. your headset. Ah, yes. Okay, so Zayn uh, just joined us here in the control room and uh, said he wants to take over on the question. So um, oh. I'll explain that just in a second. Okay, so I'm back now, back from underground. So just to explain a bit about uh, how CERN gets its funding. So we have 14 member states. And these 14 member states pay a percentage of their GDP in funding to CERN. 27. Huh? A percentage. No, 27 no. member states. Ah, 27 member That's states, and they each pay a percentage of their GDP to CERN, and it comes from taxpayer money. And also each of the experiments, their collaborations, and each of the collaborations have uh, different institutions and for institutions to join the collaboration, depending on the way uh, they're type of collaboration, they pay a membership fee as well, and they use this so that they can uh, build their experiments and uh, pay people to come as well. So there's a bunch of different uh, mechanisms, but essentially for CERN, it gets its funding from taxpayer money, and for the experiments, it gets it from CERN, but also from the universities who pay a membership fee. Yes, and that was the answer that we got back then as well. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Okay, then I have my facts right. That's good. <laughs> Anything else? I do have a question. Yes, I do. Wait, you said I do. Okay, so um, I'm not going to ask if you can hear me because I'm guessing you can. Yeah, um, you can. Check that. Okay. What are some common misconceptions about CERN and the field of like particle physics in general? biggest misconception about CERN is nuclear research, because it's in the name, European Organization for Nuclear Research. But we do experimental particle physics here, so I think that's the biggest misconception. And a lot of people think, you know, we're, we're here, we're just uh, colliding particles, and that's it, you know. But, uh, I mean, there's much more to it than just colliding particles. So that's a bit of a misconception. And you see this a lot even from people who work here who think that, yeah, you know, we're just colliding particles and trying to find if something is, is you know, new or not. But... There's much more to it, uh, as like we talked a bit about it. I mean, we create technology that ends up going to society for free. I mean, literally for free. You know, imagine if we took 0.000001% like dollars in each in the WWW would have made millions, billions. But it's not the point of CERN. You know, we give back to society and we give back to everyone. Another end as well. I mean, we do a lot of research in terms of uh, computing, uh, physics, chemistry, everything. And even when uh, they're talking a bit about uh, the environmental effects, we have people here working, checking water supplies, checking the area around to see if there's any effects on the environment. And so far, so good. And we have a lot of people already working and making measurements to make sure that we don't expose everyone else uh, to the radiation that's happening underground. And we have people that are doing uh, radiation surveys as well to make sure that people who access it are safe. So there's there's a lot going on. It's a huge engineering Feet, you know, it's not just about physics. There's so much more to it. Just building this entire facility, making people from all around the world to come here and work and to collaborate. This is insanely difficult. It's been working for for 70 years. So this is at least some part that I see as a misconception and CERN. And what was the other part of your question? Yeah, that was fine. I wanted to ask, what would a typical day for an engineer at CERN look like? <laughs> Uh, I drink that and then I write code. <laughs> it's pretty much it, <laughs> at least for me. And sometimes I get to, you know, run around. I come here and I do visits. There are some things. Uh, so part of uh, my job, for example, I work as a software engineer. So software engineering, I do web development. So I create uh, web apps for people to use. And I also do a bit of app development. So I'm working a bit on an app right now. Uh, so for me, I mean, I come to the office, I work on my code, and then I go home. That's what the typical boring day could be like. But there are other days as well, because my boss, he is the CERN advisor for the Middle East and North Africa. So he gets a lot of people from the Middle East coming in to visit CERN. So I help uh, chaperone some of the visits and uh, explain to them what we do here at CERN and essentially being a salesman one way or another. 
And also I work on uh, the HPC for L project that I mentioned for you guys about uh, working with Lebanon. So I talk to some universities and see what the progress is with the facility and also try to support in any way I can. Um, at least for my job, it's a bit of everything sometimes. And sometimes it's just, you know, writing code and uh, chilling in my office. It really depends. I mean, maybe Carolina can explain since she does uh, safety. I always see her running around here. So she, she can talk about what her typical day looks like. Um, so, yeah, I work in the safety team. So as a safety engineer. And uh, actually, just to point out, my office is actually in Meira. So that is the main uh, CERN campus on this west side, which is completely on the other side of where we are right now, CMS. But um, being safety, you do need to be on site quite a lot. So my days are sometimes a lot of running around, going in between uh, these two sites. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, there's actually quite a lot of things you can get involved with here at CERN, which I really like. You can do a lot of guiding, which we're doing right now. I'm uh, currently pausing all my work <laughs> to uh, show you guys around, and I really do enjoy doing that. And there's also in-person guides that you can do. And there's also quite a lot of clubs around at CERN, so you can do sports uh, at lunchtime, after work. So I try to do that as well. So I must say that... Um, I really do push for uh to have quite different days each day. It's not have it just, you know, your regular day where you go into the office at half past eight and then you leave at half past five and then just in the middle of it you have a one hour lunch break. Like um I must say it's uh you do have the options to kind of do a bit more, which yeah. is nice. I think we'll just to add a bit more, what's nice about CERN as well, you do have some sort of independence to to do other things as well. So part of our job as well here at CERN is to do guiding. I mean, to explain to everyone about what we do here at CERN and to show, to educate people as well. So we do have the freedom to work on uh, things like this as well. You're, you're independent and it's a good place. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not run on money, essentially. It's not corporate. It's a uh, international organization. People from all around the world come here and they're working on a goal to benefit society and not, not anything else. At least in my opinion, that's how I see it. Any uh, other questions? Please, Matas, to ask anything uh, about my job, about uh, HPC for L, or how to come to CERN. Edward has a follow-up question. Yes, yeah, I have a follow-up. So, can a student intern while they're going to university, or can they intern after they finish their bachelor's degree? So, I can explain from my case. So, I did engineering in AUB. I did, it's engineering is four years, but I haven't graduated yet, actually. I only did three years and I came here for my internship and I extended my contract for another year. So I'm here for two years and I still haven't graduated. So you can come as a continuing student to CERN. So you can come as an internship, for example, like myself, if you're in a university that's collaborated with CMS, Aumak Passport and uh, something else as well, there's the summer student program that we have at CERN. So you're able to come to that for eight weeks. You get to work on a project and uh, you can apply to this program as well to come to CERN. And you'll be a student at that time. And after you graduate as well, if uh, you're part of the member state, it's a part of any of the member states, it's much easier to come to CERN because you can apply to any of the positions available. But for someone who holds a Lebanese passport like myself, I can come as part of my institution from Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No? Uh, okay, I think we got the, all the questions now. Uh, I must admit some of our kids are probably a bit mad of this tour because they were supposed to be physically there last month. You know, so they're still holding some grudge inside. But uh, one thing that I would uh, really, and I think you can relate to this thing because as you know, our school mission is to create global citizens. So the idea of you being there and demonstrating how we have people from all over the world actually communicating on the same mission and same uh, goal. It's something that we as a school, as an international school, we strive to actually prepare or like or create in our students. So now I think 
you're an example of one success story. So we're very proud of you. And you. Uh, the most very important thing for me is that my boss here was a biologist. So now I got to show him how physics is <laughs> more important than biology. It's way cooler. <laughs> all the time so now i think it's convinced oh yeah sure so, you know a lot of the technology some uh, well we have x-rays and mris it started here so for cooler um also just one thing uh, you know I, I was in your position in 2019 i was supposed to to go to cern but i i didn't get the chance to come you know and at the time of course we'll we'll all feel sad about it and uh, it's disappointing you know there, there's nothing else to say but uh so I, I live by this, you know, and like, really, I, I didn't go, but I ended up working here. If, uh, you don't know, the world works in mysterious ways, honestly, and uh, just keep having hope and someday, you know, you'll come here, inshallah, and you'll be able to, to visit it. It's a great place, uh, you know, at the moment it sucks, but maybe you'll get the chance to come here later on. And of course, you know, we, we we did our best to show you as much as we can. And you guys got super lucky as well. Like you got to see the new control room and the you the underground cavern as well, where if you guys came here, you wouldn't have seen any of it, by the way. Yeah. All of the, the footage that you guys saw, you wouldn't have seen it in person. So yeah, you you guys got a, a special experience and you're the last group to visit the the UXC up until, uh, what's it called? June or July, whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, try to be a bit positive, but uh, I understand. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Zen, and thank you for the tour, and thank you for the team. Uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. And thank